It's falling from the clouds A strange and lovely sound I hear it in the thunder and the rain It's ringing in the skies Like cannons in the night The music of the universe plays We're singing you great and mighty the moon and the stars declare who you are I'm so unworthy but still you love me forever my heart will sing of how great you are how great song of galaxies reaching far beyond the Milky Way let's join in with the sound come on let's sing it out as the music of the universe plays we're singing you
Forever my heart will sing of a great you are. Holy Spirit, just come and stir that song within us. I thank you we don't have to get anything going this morning. The moon and the stars. The sun on this spring morning. It's all singing your glory, Lord. It all points to your greatness, to your love. So God, just help us to relax, just to join in this morning with what's already happening in the heavens and in the earth. I thank you that we're not alone. Maybe someone needs to hear that this morning. You're not alone. You're in good company. Yeah, Holy Spirit, let it be your presence we're most aware of this morning. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat, everybody. Welcome to church. It's lovely to see a few people back. And um, certainly if you're joining us from home, I really hope you're getting well. I hope to see you again soon. Just to say, Rach tested negative this morning. So last Sunday, she tested positive for COVID. This morning, she tested negative. So that's really good news. Negative. So that's really good news. And even better, I'm well and I haven't had it. So that's even better, isn't it? Uh, do you know what day it is today? March the 20th? Pardon? It's not Mother's Day. A couple more weeks till then. It is. You've been on Facebook this morning, Elaine. It is the International Day of Happiness today, according to the United Nations. It's a day where we spread some happiness because there's a lot to be unhappy about in this world, isn't there? If you're watching everything on TV. Uh, And obviously, because of COVID and everything which is going on, there's a lot to be frustrated and unhappy about. But today, we get the opportunity to try and infuse some happiness to other people. We are the carriers of it. We're the givers of it. Just a smile makes all the difference. So I'm hoping to see lots of smiles up here this morning. (laughs) Come on, give me your best smile. Grimace. (laughs) Sure you want to be here at church this morning? (laughs) Ah, right. Okay, let's talk about some of the good things that are happening around here, things that we can be happy about. Uh, Firstly, think of Norley. Norley is one of our congregation here right now. He's over in Panama at the moment. Good for Norley. (laughs) In the sun, he sent me some beautiful pictures. He's out there, not just, it's not really a holiday, it's like a ministry trip. Uh, So please pray for Norley. He's connecting with some church leaders over there. Uh, That would be great. Um, Also, what's happening? So we've been talking a lot about refugees recently. Uh, We've been part of a Churches Together uh, initiative in Gloucester, which is uh, trying to get donations for about 300 refugees who have recently arrived in Gloucester. This was before the Ukraine uh, situation. And um, so, so much has been donated throughout the county, which is amazing. And um, people are now in the process of putting together packages for the individuals at the hotels where they're staying. Uh, The next sorting time is this afternoon. So if anybody's got any time this afternoon between one and three, just head to St. Old Eights. And Dan uh, Smith, who runs Vineyard Fellowship, he's sort of heading it out over there. And uh, he would love to see you. Um, and it'd be great just to finish off what we started and get those 300 packages out. Uh, right, what else have we got coming up? So, our Stuart Gray, you can want to come up and tell us about it, Stu. Stu heads up something called Respond. It's a uh, it's an apologetics group that uh, he runs here at Kingfisher Treadworth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seeing some energy in the room this morning. Uh, tell us what you've been doing and what's coming up this coming Saturday. What I've been doing? You mean, oh, in the Respond group. I got, I got nervous there. Okay, um, so the, the Respond group is an opportunity to get together and talk about things in the culture that are generally challenging to Christianity. And it's working out how we as Christians can respond positively to it. Now, this coming Saturday, we are going to be looking at the subject of miracles. Miracles. Christianity started with the claim of a miracle, Jesus' resurrection from the dead. 
And over the last 2,000 years, the church has talked a lot about miracles. Um, and the question we're going to be looking at on Saturday morning is, do miracles happen? Can miracles happen? Are they possible? Um, a friend of mine, Elijah Stevens, who is a filmmaker, he has just released a movie where he explores these issues. Um, and it's the, the issues of doubt, the issues of evidence, the issues of proof. It, surely if the church claims that miracles happen, we have to give proof. Oh, no, 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 no. We don't have to give proof. We're the church. We can just claim it. Hang on a minute. If people in the skeptical community outside the church are going to be convinced by the church's claims of miracles, don't we have to give proof? So this is what the film's about. It has some very interesting um, discoveries and conclusions, which I'm, I'm not going to tell you about. You're going to have to watch the film to find out um, what they are. But that's what we're doing. Uh, we're going to meet at my house. This is the first time this group has met in person for over two years, which is going to be great. If you would like to know where my house is and you would like to come along, um, get in touch with Ollie or speak to me at the end. Um, yeah. Any other? Is that it? That's it. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So if that's something that interests you, if that's something you've had questions about and you want to know more about, then come on Saturday morning. What time is it? Uh, Did you say 7.45? Start at 10. <laughs> 9.45. That's a bit early on a Saturday. No. 9.45. Start at 10. Come along. Right. What else is coming up? So, as many of you will know, if you've been around in Kingfish for a long time, we used to run a, a very uh, busy coffee morning here on a Tuesday morning in partnership with Treasure Seekers. And uh, used to provide quite a lot of entertainment. It was a lot of adults with learning disabilities used to come. And um, after lockdown, because just we just didn't have a team of people to really run it, and so we weren't able to run it. Um, so we haven't had anything happening on a Tuesday morning for a long, long time. And uh, just recently, John Riando, who, who's part of our congregation here, and Rosa, who's here this morning, um, have got their heads together and they said, could we run something on a Tuesday morning? Try and engage some of our senior citizens and try and engage some of the people from our community who we know are isolated and, and, and they're not really seeing anybody. So from next Tuesday, a week on Tuesday, 29th of March, from 10 to 11.30, we're launching this new thing called Open House. It's a drop-in. Just come for some good company. It is good company, in Rosa. Good company and a cuppa. And we'll see what happens with the group there after that. We'll see who engages in it and see if we can get our community to come and join in. So if that's something you'd like to be involved in, then please, by all means, talk to me, talk to Rosa and, uh, and John. That's going to start week on Tuesday. Right, what else is coming up? So we were meant to have a test in the night last Wednesday, but because so many people were ill, we decided to postpone it. So it's actually going to be a week on Wednesday. Wednesday, that says the 16th. It's actually going to be on the 30th, 30th of March. Uh, if you've got a testimony to tell, if you want to encourage the church, or if you've got something on your heart that you feel God has been saying to you, which again is going to encourage the church, then let me know and we'll get you a slot. I've got a few people already lined up. And, uh, and if you haven't, you just want some encouragement. You, you want to hear what God is doing in people's lives right now then come along on Wednesday evening, the 30th of March, 7.30 p.m. here at church. And we're having a spring clean, everybody. <laughs> here at church. April, I think it's the 2nd. Is that a Saturday? Saturday, April the 2nd, 10 from 10 o'clock. Come along, get involved. We want to spruce this place up. We've got tiles to change. We've got carpets to clean. We've got paintwork to decorate. We've got lots of little admin, uh, little maintenance jobs to uh, complete. We've got a wedding coming up here in April, and we'd really like this place to look a little bit better than it already does. So if you've got some time, you want to come and wash some windows or get some weeds up in the car park, every person, every hand is going to make a difference. 
And you get to be part of community. You get to be part of a team. And we have a great morning together. So come along, April 10th. Is that it? Pardon? What did I say? April 2nd. Where did I get the 10th from? (laughs) Oh, pray for me, everybody. Why have you come to church this morning? It's a rhetorical question. Think about it for yourself. Sometimes we can just get into the habit of coming to church, can't we? And, uh, and we just go, we sing a couple of songs, we have a listen, we think it all sounds very nice, and we go home and everything just carries on as it always did. No, actually, this is a, a dynamic time of us meeting with God and with each other. And God promises his, a, a real sense of his presence as we gather in his name, which means that anything is possible. And we've been doing this series called Recover Your Life, and it's all about recovering the life that God has for each one of us through Jesus. And today is one of the, the weeks where actually it is very practical. There are some steps, some things we really need to do. And I'm sure this is going to involve every single one of us. So all I'm saying is get yourself ready. Get your head in a good space. Listen. Check your heart. Do some work with God. Meet with him this morning. And maybe this could be a life-changing day for you today. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you that you are here. Lord, I thank you that you are in the business of salvation and transformation. Lord, I thank you for for your promise, Jesus, where, where you said, you said that you are the way, the truth, and the life. You said that you have come to give us life in all its fullness. And Lord, I pray that whatever is getting in the way of that for us, whatever is an obstacle, whatever is stopping us from moving forward with you, I just pray that you would show us this morning. And by your spirit, would you move us forward? Would you give us those breakthroughs that so many of us desperately need? Amen. Amen. So I want to start this morning with a parable of Jesus that he told um, in response to an interesting and pertinent question from one of his disciples. This is Matthew 18, verse 21. It starts. If you want to follow along, if you've got a Bible app or a Bible with you, I'm actually going to be reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how many times will my brother sin against me and I forgive him and let it go? Up to seven times? Actually, I think I'm reading from the Amplified Version. So change it if you need to. (laughs) Up to seven times? I mean, that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Because if someone is doing the same thing over and over again, then there comes a point where enough is enough, right? Jesus answered, I say to you, not up to seven times, but 70 times seven, which is a way of saying you don't stop. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began the accounting, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, a silver or gold talent was worth approximately 15 years' wages. So 10,000 of them. This is an unpayable debt. But because he could not repay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and everything that he possessed and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And his master's heart was moved with compassion and he released him and forgave him, cancelling the debt. How would you react if all your debts were just wiped out. How would you react? But that same slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. It's less than a year's wage. And he seized him and began choking him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow slave fell on his knees and begged him earnestly, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling. 
And he went and had him thrown in prison until he paid back the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved. And they went and reported to their master with clarity and in detail everything that had taken place. Then his master called him and said to him, you wicked and contemptible slave, I forgave all that great debt of yours because you begged me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave who owed you little by comparison as I had mercy on you? And in his wrath, his master turned him over to the the jailers until he paid all that he owed. My heavenly father will also do the same to every one of you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. You know, what's you know, fascinating me from this story is that, that Jesus points out that you can be set free, your debt paid in full, released to live in a different way. I mean, that's what God offers each one of us, by the way, through the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's that, that, that's what happened when I gave my life to him, when I received and responded to his invitation. And yet, I can still choose to hold on to grievances and hurts, locked into ways of behaving which are destructive to both myself and to others around me, instead of enjoying the new life and the new freedom and opportunity that God has given me. You know, becoming a Christian is never meant to be just about what is in it for me, but how my redeemed, forgiven, and changed life then impacts the world. You know, the wicked servant in the story, it was as if he didn't appreciate how much he had been set free from. And in not, in not then acting in the same merciful way that he had been treated, he ended up in a worse condition. You know, the early church was given this warning. You can read this in Galatians 5.1. Freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. Stand then as free people and do not allow yourselves to become slaves again. I mean, how frightening and tragic the the possibility that I could allow myself (laughs) to not live in the freedom I've been given. This whole series has been about recovering the life that God always intended for you and I to have. But what we've, been, what we've been seeing is that it takes walking with Jesus and working with Jesus, watching him and keeping company with him in order to learn how to live freely and lightly. This doesn't just happen by chance on your own. We need to start doing things God's way. I hear so many people questioning why God isn't doing what they think he should be doing. Maybe you've asked those sort of questions. But just as valid is the question, what are we not doing that God has told us to do? Because this world functions a whole lot better when we start doing things God's way. Problem is we hold on to things far too tightly that God wants us to let go of. Attitudes, judgments, behaviors, grievances towards others and to ourselves. But in showing us amazing grace, God wants us to go and do likewise. This has been our key verse of the series, this amazing invitation from Jesus himself that you find in Matthew 11, where he says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. You know, rest here isn't about lying back and not doing anything. It's not that sort of rest. It's about letting God be God, enjoying a relationship with him whereby we can trust in his justice and his way of making things right, letting him carry the weight of those things that stress us out and wear us down rather than believing it's our responsibility to carry them. You know, that rest is characterized and outworked in these next verses. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely 
and lightly. So recovery is found as we follow Jesus and do things his way. And we've been looking over the last few weeks at some recovery principles, a a series of steps that move us further in that direction, the direction that God wants to take us. But as we've seen, these aren't necessarily easy steps to take. And so often we wrestle for control under the false delusion that we know better than God does. I'm always reminded of the the Israelites back in the Old Testament, thousands of years ago, who cried out to God for help. And he sent Moses to lead them out of slavery, right? Many of you remember the story. God didn't airlift them out of Egypt. They had to walk out, and they had to keep walking to keep trusting in God's provision and in his direction. Would they be willing to follow and to enter the land that God had promised them. And you know what? The first time they couldn't. (laughs) The first time they didn't. They didn't take that opportunity. They didn't quite trust God enough. They allowed their own feelings to rule them instead. But listen, God never gave up on them, just like he never gives up on us. And eventually they did enter the land And God had been real all the time. His presence had been with them all the time. His promises were true all along. But it was only as they courageously stepped out in faith and actually put their trust in him and walked in his ways that they saw the promise become a reality. And that's the relationship God wants us to have with him. That's the aim of the Christian life. For for each one of us to take hold of God's promises, to come to that place of believing that our loving God does know best for my life, and believing that with Him I can face anything. And He has a good plan for my life that is worth pursuing as I trust Him with it. This is how the prophet Isaiah put it, Isaiah 29, 16. He said, He is the potter, And he is certainly greater than you, the clay. Should the created thing say to the one who made it, he didn't make me? Does a jar ever say, the potter who made me is stupid? Well, no. You know, God made me and you. And he didn't make a mistake. And he does understand who I am and why I'm here. No matter what I might think and feel in the moment, or how I've been treated by others. Remember the story of the ugly duckling last week? He created me by his design for a purpose of his choosing. And I am most fulfilled when I become who God made me to be. That's what I'm recovering, my true identity and a right way of living. Not fighting against God, but working with him, spending time with him. He says, make me your first port of call. Put me first. When so much in this world is demanding your attention and wearing you out, remember the recovery checklist that we've been going through over these last few weeks. It's been the backbone of this series. Realize I am not God, first principle. Earnestly believe that God exists and that I matter to him, number two. Number three, consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. Oh, was openly examine and confess my faults to myself, to God, and to someone I trust. And last week, we were looking at voluntarily submit to every change that God wants to make in my life. These are all stages, intentions, decisions, which will help you and me recover life in all its fullness. Have you worked out where you are on that road of recovery yet, I wonder? Well, this next principle is highlighted by the parable that I read you a moment ago. And it's absolutely key to helping us live freely and lightly. But it's where so many of us actually get stuck. I can accept that God has forgiven me as I've examined my life and confessed the things that I've done wrong. But God then wants me to show that same grace and forgiveness to myself and to others, which sounds great until you come to 
do it. <laughs> Here's the principle. It says, evaluate all my relationships, offer forgiveness to those who've hurt me, and make amends for any harm I've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. Here's how Jesus put it in his teaching that we call the Beatitudes. And today there are two that sum up this principle. This is Matthew 5, 7, where he says, Happy are those who are merciful to others. God will be merciful to them. And the second one is Matthew 5, 9. Happy are those who work for peace. God will call them his children. Now, does everyone remember the Lord's Prayer? I bet we've all stood in school assemblies back in the day and recited it. <laughs> I remember this terrible teacher. I think he was an atheist. And we were all doing the Lord's Prayer one day, and he, he wasn't happy. We weren't saying it loud enough. So he made us stop and start again. I mean, any way of putting people off prayer, that was it. But this is the Lord's Prayer. It was a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they said, teach us how to pray. It's a real pattern for prayer, and it starts with a recognition of who is actually in charge. Our Father. That's the relationship. Our Father. And we're praying for His will to be done in the here and now, to give us what we need, our daily bread. He's our provider. Acknowledging that there are temptations which are destructive to our lives, but praying for Him to keep us from evil and lead us in right paths. And it finishes with a declaration about his power and his glory, reminding us of the resources we have in him and who this life is really all about. And in the middle of this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples is this line. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Some versions say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I like the word trespass, though. As a kid, I had no idea what it meant. <laughs> Didn't even know what I was praying. But actually, the most common meaning of trespass is when you are on someone else's land without their permission. Unlawfully on ground where you shouldn't be walking. And I think it's a great way of understanding sin. Any trespass, any wrongdoing is when I am stepping into territory where I shouldn't be. Away from God's path, stepping beyond his safe boundaries. Here's how the Amplified Bible translates that verse. It says, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, letting go of both the wrong and the resentment. Letting go. Letting go. Forgiveness is something that we both receive from God, but it is also given to really do his work. We're actually praying in that prayer, God, in the same way that I forgive others, that's how I want you to forgive me. Now, that changes things, doesn't it? In fact, at the end of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus went back to this one line, and he says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, nurturing your hurt and anger with the result that it interferes with your relationship with God, then your Father will not forgive you your trespasses. You know, unforgiveness, which is really nurturing your hurt and anger, holding on to it, will always interfere with your relationship with God. It always gets in the way of receiving his forgiveness fully for yourself. It will always leave you feeling worse and stuck, just like the king's servant in the story, who encountered amazing grace, but still continued to deal in the currency of judgment. If you're struggling to feel a closeness or a connection with God, then ask yourself, the question, is there someone I need to forgive? It's been said that unforgiveness is like, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It will always cause you more pain and suffering than it will ever cause the person who hurt you. 
And have you ever taken part in a tug of war match? Do they still do things like that? Anyone knows? You know what a tug of war is, right? We have a rope, two teams or two people, and you're trying to pull them over to your side. No one wants to give any ground. It takes so much energy to keep on pulling, doesn't it? And you know, unforgiveness is like this. Until they see it my way, until they admit what they did, until I've been proven right, then I'm just going to keep pulling. But the problem is in that scenario is that you stay tied to that person. Someone once said, as long as the people on each end of the rope are tugging, you have a war. When you forgive others, you let go of your end of the rope. No matter how hard they may tug on that end, if you have released your end, the war is over. It is finished. But until you release it, you are a prisoner of war. When you hold on to resentments and offenses and anger and hurt and bitterness, when your focus is set on that person and what they did to you, it will wear you down. It will wear you out. It is so damaging to your spiritual health, let alone your mental health and your physical health. These are heavy things to carry around with you, taking all your energy. And then there are the regrets and the guilt and the the shame of things we've done to others, and we can hold ourselves in unforgiveness, in suspended judgment. Now, let me tell you some things that forgiveness is not. It is not a feeling. If you're waiting to feel forgiving, it will never happen. It's not condoning what was done to you. It's not saying it was okay. It's not letting someone off the hook. It does not mean pretending it didn't happen. It does not mean forgetting. It does not mean reconciliation necessarily or having to trust that other person again. Forgiveness is the act of letting go. I am not going to nurture this hurt and anger anymore. It is saying, God, I don't want to stay in this tug of war, so I am releasing this person into your judgment. I love it when someone's pulling on a rope and you're pulling too, and then you let go. (laughs) What happens to them? Yeah. I'm trusting you, God, to deal with this. I'm trusting in your justice, in your ability to just and deal with this fairly. And I'm trusting that rather than taking matters into my own hands. Instead, I will be merciful. I will work for peace. And isn't that what Jesus did? 1 Peter 2, 23, when he was reviled and insulted, he did not revile or offer insult in return. When he was abused and suffered, he made no threats of vengeance, but he trusted himself and everything to him who judges fairly. You know, Jesus willingly went to the cross. He didn't deserve any of that. And yet with his dying breath, his prayer was still, Father, forgive them. Isn't that amazing? I've been struggling with my own things. There's people in my life, I find it really hard to forgive. I've been trying to work through some of it this week. But without Jesus, there would be no grace no salvation, no rest, no hope for any of us without the willingness of Jesus to let go of his life. It was only then through his death that he was able to be resurrected, right? We're coming up to Easter. We're going to be hearing more about this. If any of us want to experience that resurrected, recovered life, then there has to be a dying to self, a letting go It's what this whole series has been about. Let go of the belief that I'm God and I'm in charge. Let go of having to do things my way. 
Let go of trying to hold it all together. Let go of thinking I have to change myself. Let go of the regret. Let go of the hurt. It starts when you first cry out to God for help and admit your need. It happens as you invite Jesus in as your Lord and Savior. You will experience a letting go as you receive his forgiveness. Understanding that Jesus took all of your wrong when he died on a cross and in exchange has given you his right standing. It's really only then in the knowledge of how much you are loved by God and how much you have been forgiven that you are then able to truly forgive yourself and to forgive other people. Yes, it might still feel like a difficult thing to do, but feelings do not have to determine acts of the will. You know, the problem with the king's servant, according to the story, was that he was unwilling. That's what it said. Having the willingness to forgive and the willingness to make amends, despite how you might feel, is the beginning of your next step of recovery. Feelings will catch up eventually. Facing your past, forgiving yourself and those who have hurt you, making amends for the pain you've caused others is the only lasting solution to the effects of hurt and pain that continue to harass you. The other person might never admit what they did. They might not even be here anymore to clear up the mess they created. But you can still clean your side of the street. It's what we talk about in Celebrate Recovery. You can still clean your side of the street. Forgiveness breaks the cycle. It stops the tug of war. It releases you from the people and situations that you might still feel tied to. Now, it doesn't automatically settle all the questions of blame, justice, or fairness, but it does allow for healing to start and recovery to continue. Because as you choose to forgive, you then get to fully appreciate and receive the forgiveness of God that he extends to you. You know, the 12 steps which are used in many recovery support groups They give some really practical things to do. Step eight is we made a list of all those persons we'd harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And step nine is we made amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. You know, making a list of those who have hurt us and another of those we have hurt is a great thing to do. Not to get mad all over again (laughs) or to beat yourself up again, but with the intent to let it go, with the intent to forgive, to move forward. And remember, this is all done within the supportive family of the church and in the knowledge that God is with us. And he will give us the power to help us recover. None of this is meant to be done in isolation on your own. Please don't do that. If you want a bit of wisdom to help you this week as you think about who you might need to forgive, or who you need to make amends to, then here it is from Matthew 7, 12. Actually, the Bible entitles it, The Golden Rule. If there's any rule to follow, it's this one. So then, in everything, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. The Golden Rule. Do to others as you would have them do to you. We all want acceptance and Mercy and grace shown towards us. I know I do. And that's certainly been my experience of how God has treated me. So let's be willing to go and do likewise. It will change the way you think. It will transform your life. Here's those Beatitudes again, this time from the message version. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. And that's the point of all of this. 
That's the point of recovery, to discover who you really are, to realize your place in God's family, to enjoy the freedom that he gives so you can be involved in his glorious plans. There is nowhere else I know I want to be. Don't know about you, but that's where I want to be. So what is keeping you stuck when God has offered you the means through Jesus to be set free? Are you still holding yourself or someone else in suspended judgment and refusing to let it go? I'm not downplaying anything that you've done. I'm not negating anything that has been done to you. But can I humbly ask you this morning to consider the way of forgiveness, the way of Jesus? Do you need to forgive yourself this morning? Do you need to forgive someone else today? Jesus says, come to me. So let's do that right now. Why don't we stand together? And I'm going to pray for us. Father, I thank you for the practicality of your word. I thank you, Lord, that I thank you, Lord, that you want to work with us. That Lord, even though we cry out to you for help, so often the solution is working with you and doing things your way. And I just pray this morning. I pray for that breakthrough for even one person who has been holding themselves in suspended judgment or holding someone else in that judgment and they can't let go. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that it is let go, that rope is let go of, that tie is broken, that cycle is finished. Lord, I pray for freedom for each one of us as we come humbly to you, as we receive your forgiveness, as Lord, as we try to be and show that same mercy and grace this week. Lord, would you help us? And if we need help from someone else, show us, Lord, who to talk to. Help us to get some prayer and some help. Lord, we don't want to stay stuck. We don't want to be in the same place this week that we were this time last year. Lord, we want to be moving with you. We want to be going your way. We want to be free to do what you've called us here to do. So Holy Spirit, come and help us. Help us to recover the life that you want to give us. Amen. Love floods in, it covers 
love others as we love ourselves. That if our love towards ourselves is broken, then of course that's going to show in how we treat one another. So let it stop here. In Jesus' name, let it stop here. Lord, we thank you for forgiveness. And I just want to speak that afresh in the name that's above every other name. The name that sets people free. Because of that righteous royal blood that was spilled on our behalf. So we wouldn't have to waste another moment living in unforgiveness, living in bondage, living in judgment, fear, doubt. It all ends at the cross. It all went into that tomb. And the only thing, the only one that came out was Jesus. He put everything in its place in that tomb, nailed to that cross. And he said, it is finished. Cause I am a child of God. Just sing that. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. No, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. Come on, claim it. Yes, I am a child of God. I'm fully alive in you. Yes, I am a child of God. I'm going to sing till I believe it. I am. Child of God, fully free, yes, I am a child of God. It's who you say I am, yes, I am a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. reminds me of a verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So whatever you're saying in your mind right now, I can't do that, I can't do that. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And with that, I'm going to close our service this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for engaging. Don't rush off. Please just stay. Have some tea and coffee. Have some conversation. And then go and enjoy this beautiful Sunday and go and show some happiness to somebody on this International Day of Happiness, right? And I'll see you here next Sunday. I hope so. Have a good week, everybody.